Hi. <laughs> My name is Kate Bell. Um, I'm from the Marijuana Policy Project, the nation's largest organization devoted exclusively to reforming our country's mar uh, marijuana laws. We work at the state level um, with state legislatures, uh, as well as on ballot initiatives and in Congress. Um, we were responsible for the initiatives in five of the eight states that now allow adult use across the country. Um, and I just want to thank you for um, taking the time to address this important issue and for having me here to speak today. Um, I did submit written testimony. Um, however, much of what I address in the testimony has already been discussed by other witnesses. And so rather than repeating um, what's already been uh, well said, I wanted to address some of the questions and issues that have come up um, as I've sat here throughout the day. Um, uh, there was a question early on about studies um, with regard to marijuana use and opiate treatment. Um, there was a uh, peer-reviewed published study that looked at whether or not marijuana use would impact someone's adjustment to medication-assisted treatment to methadone treatment. It was very clear in reading the abstract that the study authors thought that it would be harmful and were quite surprised at the clear result which suggested that um, cannabis use actually helps people adjust to that treatment regime, which makes them more likely to, to stay in it and therefore you know, be successful um, in being able to stop heroin use. Um, so that's a very encouraging study, and I'm happy to provide that um, to you all. Um, and in addition, I wanted to um, address something that is in my written testimony. Um, there's an international team that actually did a very comprehensive survey looking at 60 studies um, on cannabis and mental health. And according to the lead author of that study, quote, research suggests that people may be using cannabis as an exit drug to reduce use of substances that are potentially more harmful, such as opioid pain medication. Um, so while there's certainly a benefit of doing further research, there is data indicating um, that cannabis can be helpful um, to folks who are struggling with um, opioid use. And there's actually a recent study out of Canada suggesting that it can also help people who are trying to stop using crack cocaine as well. Um, um, to go back to the very beginning of our day, um, the issue of driving under the influence of drugs was raised, and I know that that has been a concern of some of our um, opponents to allowing for adult use, so I just wanted to briefly address that. Um, first of all, there's some scary statistics that get thrown around by opponents suggesting that there's been an increase in states like Colorado in what they call, quote, marijuana-related traffic fatalities. Um, the word related doesn't mean what you think it does or what it does in the dictionary. Um, what marijuana related actually means in that data is simply that someone involved in that fatal crash tested positive for marijuana and all that that means is that they used marijuana sometime in the last month. Um, because a lot of these tests are for metabolites, so the, the products that um, THC breaks down into in your body and those can stick around for a um, very long period of time after you consume, particularly people who consume marijuana on a regular basis. Um, so it suggests that perhaps there are more people driving in Colorado who at some point in the past months smoked marijuana, but it does not suggest um, that um, the legalization has caused um, those fatalities. Um, another thing that I want to point out about um, the, a flaw in the data is that um, it's been cited that there, well, there's been an increase in fatal crashes in Colorado since they legalized marijuana. That is actually true, um, but the reason for that is because the economy is booming, and there's a very strong correlation between traffic fatalities and an improved economy, because more people are going to work, they're commuting, people are taking longer vacations because they have more money, um, and so they're driving more. Um, and if you actually look at the fatalities in Colorado per million miles driven, those have not increased since legalization. And that's really what um, you want to look at is, is legalization causing the roads to be less safe? Um, and the data simply is not showing that. And in fact, in Colorado, um, the number of DUID arrests has decreased slightly despite increased enforcement efforts. Um, and there's been a push in that state to do public education to address um, the DUID issue, and some of the funds raised from tax revenue can be used to train law enforcement as well as to do that public education work. Um, so I just wanted to address those concerns. Um, there was a question earlier today about home cultivation. 
Um, every state that allows adult use does allow some form of home cultivation, but in Washington state, it's actually only for medical patients. Um, and in Nevada, it's limited to folks who live a long way from a store um, to ensure that they have access so it's not everyone that gets to cultivate at home. Um, however, you know, we would, um, MPP would support allowing home cultivation, both from the personal freedom point of view, but also because it can help reduce costs, um, which is particularly important for patients um, who may not be able to afford medical marijuana if they're able to cultivate at home. Um, the str a strain that's helpful for them, that can help ensure that they have affordable access. Um, and it does not hurt tax revenue. Um, I've heard that concern from some people. and. Um, in Colorado, they are bringing in $200 million a year um, in revenue, and that is a state that does allow uh, home cultivation. So it really, um, while it is a great benefit for some people, the vast majority of people are going to go to the store to purchase um, cannabis, just like they go to the store to purchase beer, even though there are, people are allowed to brew beer in their homes, and a few people take advantage of that. Um, in terms of um, public housing was another thing that was brought up today, and it's actually federal law that blocks people from being able to have cannabis in their um, public housing because of the federal subsidy. So the state of New York can't actually change that zero tolerance federal law that landlords are forced to put into place if they accept um, the federal money for public housing. But what the state of New York can do to address this problem and to make sure that there's not legalization for people wealthy enough to own their own home and not legalization for poor communities where people are living in public housing is to provide an alternative lawful regulated space for people to consume cannabis. Um, and there's a number of social use models that can be put in place um, that are being looked at in other states, um, Denver, Las Vegas, Massachusetts as well is going to be implementing that. Um, so in addition to a personal freedom issue, um, as well as, um, you know, a sort of a fairness issue, why can you go to a bar, but adults can't congregate to choose a less healthy, alter or, excuse me, a more healthy alternative of using cannabis, it's also a social justice issue because it ensures that everyone can have um, a, a safe and legal place to go rather than being criminalized um, for consuming on the street because they are, are in a different housing situation. Um, Can I just interrupt with a question sure. on that? On the public housing thing, uh, is there a federal mandate on public housing agencies to actively enforce? That yes, they're required to have zero tolerance. So if you, are, even if you're a private landlord, if you accept Section 8 um, housing vouchers, you are required to have a zero, zero tolerance policy for all federally illegal drugs, which includes cannabis, even if you're a patient. I Actually, there's a woman who came to testify to hearing in the District of Columbia um, who is a medical patient, and she was complaining about some mold in her um, housing, and her landlord threatened that if she complained to the authorities about this issue that he would throw her out of the housing because he knew she was a patient and he actually has the authority under federal law to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the final thing I wanted to touch on in my um, time today is the um, licensing and the diversity piece. Um, you know, one way to ensure that there's more diversity in the industry is to uh, allow a free market as opposed to um, you know this very small number of licenses um, because when you have the very limited numbers like that inevitably the people who get those licenses are going to be ones with tremendous amount of capital um, with who are well connected um, and um, you know if if a free market is um, too much for some of your colleagues um, who grew up in the era of free for madness uh, prohibition uh, and propaganda. Um, as you go through the process, another option to consider um, is what we would call a qualified lottery. So essentially allowing anyone who meets the uh, minimal qualifications to hold a license to be entered into the lottery. And if it is random, that should re result in a diverse industry if the applicant pool is diverse. 
Um, and ensuring a diverse applicant pool could include things like outreach to different communities so that they know about the opportunities that are available, as well as not putting unnecessary restrictions on who can participate. A lot of states have put a blanket prohibition on anyone with a criminal record for drugs on participating in the industry. And of course, the problem with that, as we know from what we've heard today, is that that's going to have a racially discriminatory impact. Um, so rather than doing that, looking at, you know, how long has it been since your conviction? Um, yeah, is there evidence of rehabilitation rather than just putting a blanket ban on anyone with a record participating in the industry? Um, as well as ensuring that there aren't excessive capital requirements um, because of the um, disparate nature in um, the, the wealth disparity um, between people of color and um, that, that is going to lead to less access to capital um, because, because of the federal status of cannabis, you can't just go and apply for a bank loan like you would for other types of businesses. So it's harder to um, get the investment and to get the capital together. Um, and ensuring that there is a place for small businesses um, can also help. Um, one option that we can be considered is allowing small craft cultivators just like we have, you know, sort of craft breweries, and then there's there's Budweiser, um, ensuring that um, businesses that only are growing small amounts um, have lower licensing fees and less red tape can also help um, ensure diversity. Um, and um, if race is going to be considered in the licensing process, uh, a disparity study does need to to be done, and that was mentioned earlier. And that's something that um, can be started now looking towards a future of additional licenses so that that data is available um, to a future regulator looking at whether or not there's been evidence of discrimination in the cannabis industry in um, New York and the, on the medical side or in other states um, and in similar industries such as agriculture um, and retail so that um, a number of steps can be taken to try to ensure diversity. Can I just ask a quick question sure. on, just on that topic? You said a, a disparity study. Um, your organization has been active in helping states put laws on the books for a couple of years, right? Yeah, I, MPP has existed for over 20 years, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you mean you all don't, don't already have data on how it looks and who has the business as a result of? Well, according to the so the so United States Supreme Court is not a huge fan of taking race into account, but by the government. Um, so this is what the U.S. Supreme Court well, decisions I'm not would about require. United States. I'm talking about um, California, the states that have legalized. You don't you don't have records on that yet. Well, the state itself has to do the study in order for the state to take race into account, according to the constitutional decisions of the Supreme Court. So I can. You know, we can give you that data, but the state still has to be the author of the study in order for the state to take race into account in its own decision making. Well, you can't give me the data if you don't have it. Is the point? You, you don't have the data already. You don't. Well, I don't have the. There is. There has been data. There have been surveys that have been done um, of the industry, but it it would be looking at specifically at New York at, um, like I said, comparable industries, like what's done for an MBE program. But it would have to come from the state okay, in I, order I to... Okay, I understand that part of it, but I, I was wondering if, in fact, say, Colorado, mm -hmm. if you know how many businesses are uh, minority-owned in Colorado, without doing a disparity study, would you know that? If there's a no? Not off the top of my head. It's uh, not many, unfortunately. Right, so... My point is there's not a lot to really study because there hasn't been any real effort to try and see that there were minorities that have access to businesses yet in, in this industry. Um, the state of New York has a disparity study, but it didn't look at medical marijuana. It didn't need to. It's only been around, what, four years, and we already know there's only one business mm -hmm. that's of minority descent that in the state of New York that deals with cannabis. Uh, except for maybe hemp farmers there, our hemp farmers. Mm -hmm. So um, I was just wondering uh, if you actually knew that, since I know that your organization has been pretty active on this topic for a while. I mean, I can tell you that in the District of Columbia, there's one business um, that is owned by an African-American because that's one of the places that I personally work. Um, 
there are, I believe, eight cultivators and five dispensaries um, yeah. in the District of Columbia. So I can tell you that from personal knowledge. I mean, I will say that um, there was a New Frontier, which is a data a organization that looks at a lot of data, a lot of different types of data around the marijuana industry, did a survey, um, and the what they found in that survey, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I apologize, okay. was that the cannabis industry is actually a little more diverse in terms of um, than some of the other industries in this country, but that's not to say that it's as diverse as it should be. Um, just that, um, you know, if you look at the diversity of CEOs of companies in this country, um, you know, of different types of companies, it's not very diverse. Well, does it, the requirement for data apply if you are using criteria that are not explicitly race, but are sort of proxies for race? Uh, no. So I'm glad that, that you asked that. Um, the constitutional decisions on this require the state to have done the study, and you have to do it before the preferences, because there was a case in Baltimore where they did the study after they had um, take, used racial preferences, and it, of course, validated the preferences that they'd used, but the court said, no, you have to, do, you have, to have done it first. Um, but they also, you're required to consider race-neutral alternatives. Um, and one of those was mentioned already today of looking at where people are from um, and giving an advantage perhaps to people from neighborhoods that have been over-policed, um, which obviously tend to be poor um, minority neighborhoods. Um, and that would be one way, because the criteria isn't are you a person of color? It's are you from this neighborhood? That would be one potential race neutral alternative that could be considered. 